Thank you for joining us on the Real Religion Podcast today, where a rabbi and a reverend walk into a podcast and talk real about religion. Joel, good afternoon. Howdy. I can't see you today, man. Where's your video? Wait, what do you mean? All I see is a little like globe on oh, a yeah. brown background. Oh, yeah. You know what that's from? That's a picture from uh, the video game No Man's Sky, which is a fascinating little game. That's not so little. <laughs> that had no clue, but I, I realize you are the guy that plays 400 video games a little, and I'm the guy that uh, plays uh, one or two video games a lot, so I get it. Yes, as your level in Call of Duty attests to. <laughs> Hey, thanks for that Passover episode. It's gotten some great feedback, and uh, I know a lot of folks have listened to it and been uh, been grateful to hear more about oh. the, the the Jewish faith through that beautiful ritual and celebration. And how was it for y'all? Well, it still is going on, but uh, but the actual seders uh, were great. Uh, our first one, uh, typically my wife and I, or not typically, in the last five years or so, we've had 40, 50 people over our, our house and of course, this year, like last year, we weren't able to do that. But uh, we are blessed enough to have both sets of parents in town and then uh, one uh, family that's kind of in our pod and also has an infant. And so uh, we had a good time, did some creative things. And I also used used everyone as a little bit of guinea pigs for my congregational Zoom Seder uh, for the next night. Uh and uh, we're still going, and I'm already craving pizza, nice. which I can't have until Saturday night. <laughs> is it Saturday to Saturday? Is that the way it works? Well, it depends how you – like most things in Judaism, it's complicated. It's a very long explanation that very few people would be interested in. Needless to say, I celebrate seven. Nice. <laughs> and then uh, you have a, a holiday coming up. That's right. Yes, Palm Sunday was uh, the other day, and now we are in the midst of Holy Week, our – Seven days of uh, celebration and preparation and anticipation. And you look surprisingly – well, maybe it's not surprising, but you look calm and happy. Is that just, uh, is just, the, is that just the Zoom glow or how are, you, how are you feeling this week? That is uh, – the experienced pastor in me knows that on Holy Week, Easter week, you enter Monday as if it's already Thursday. So you can't do Monday stuff, Tuesday stuff, Wednesday stuff on Holy Week. You just have to jump straight to getting everything ready. Uh, so I've already finished the April newsletter article, the Wednesday prayer devotional piece, the Good Friday video service, and started my Easter sermon. Uh, and I, it, it helps you just accelerate the process and survive I'm it sure. if you get ahead of it. Well, I'd love you to take me and our listeners through it. I mean, I certainly know very little about Easter, but it seems like there's a whole kind of lead up to that. And I'd be interested in that. Sure. And maybe that's a great place to start is what are the things that, that you feel like you know or understand about Easter? And then we'll take it from there. If I say Cadbury eggs, is that offensive? Totally fine. Of course. <laughs> yes. And the bunny and all that. Exactly. Yes. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I certainly understand that, uh, Easter represents the, the resurrection of, of Jesus. And, um, from my, from something you said last week, which resonated with me in terms of some things in, in Judaism is that if you don't take seriously his death, in terms of going to church, ritual, theology, it doesn't maybe make much sense to then just come on Easter. So I'd I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Sure. I mean, I don't want I don't want to box you in either. I mean, just just go with whatever you uh, with whatever you want. <laughs> well, across the wider Christian world, uh, those who claim the Christian faith have argued about all kinds of doctrinal issues and theological issues, everything from virgin birth, right? I don't know if you've heard of that one, right? But 
Uh, Heard of it. <laughs> yeah. Who, who was God? Who was Jesus's daddy? Uh, right. There's this gal, Mary, and she's suddenly pregnant and Joseph doesn't, he, she was engaged to Joseph, but they hadn't been together yet and she's pregnant. So what's Joseph going to do? Is he going to discard her? Um, is he going to stone her to death to have the community stone her to death and embarrass her? Um, and the, one of the gospels kind of talks about it as if Holy Spirit is the father of the child inside the virgin, which really in Greek just meant little girl Mary. And Christians debate the uh, genetic and scientific and issues of all that. Um, for me, the core of Christianity, all those other issues that we've debated and argued about for a really long time, they're interesting and uh, they make for a great topic and teasers and curiosity sparks, but Easter is kind of the one. Uh, if Jesus of Nazareth was a smart guy, a rebel, a a teacher, a prophet, a somebody who was willing to challenge the status quo, a Mahatma Gandhi, Mother Teresa, MLK, all wrapped in one. <laughs> Somebody who tried to face down oppression and challenge the systems and take care of the orphans and the sick. Uh, if he did all of that and then died because of it, we have thousands of people throughout time that did that. And there are a lot of Christians who struggle with the Easter stepping stone. But the Easter stepping stone is, yes, he did do all of that. He taught those things. He challenged those things. He cared and healed. And because he didn't just die um, because it was God's plan, he died because he challenged the systems and structures, because he lifted up the poorest and the marginalized and the most oppressed. That's why the religious leaders in the church killed him. They... And when I say they, I really mean we. Um, that we we have a song that we sing uh, around Easter time. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? And the answer to that implied is yes, we were all there. What what makes the Christian faith a faith isn't anything else other than three days later he rose again. And there were witnesses to that and storytellers of that and encount people who encountered that either in some in the body and some in some other form and some in a feeling and uh, some in a, a, a kind of an ethereal encounter with him. And, and uh, Easter becomes that point where whatever he said, whatever he did, whatever he taught, we have to know that it leads to a confrontation with those who are in charge and in power, which is sometimes us. And it, and our uh, complicity with those systems is sin itself, and the consequences of sin is death, just like Jesus' death. But death doesn't get the final word. There is something more beyond that. And we couldn't believe that if not for his resurrection. So Easter is... Uh, it's not just a woohoo after death, I'm going to live again. It's a, I am going to fight the principalities and powers that cause death, that cause sin and pain and destruction and sickness. I'm going to fight those, even if it costs me everything, because its real cost is nothing. Easter, mm. Easter is a promise that our fight against those things that lead to death for ourselves and for others are not is not in vain. Can I ask a few questions as an ignorant non-Christian? Ask away. Is there a word for non-Christian the way there is for non-Jew? Atheist. <laughs> well, come on, that's in America, if you're not a Christian, you're an atheist. <laughs> He's saying that with tongue in cheek, listeners, for people who don't who don't know him. Oh man! Uh, but no, I mean, is there is there a word for non-believers? It so to speak, just non-Christians. I okay. don't think so. I 
And the thing atheist. I remind people all the time is... Half of atheists are Jews. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> the thing I try to remind people is uh, Jesus wasn't a Christian. You know, he, right. he was a Jew, a Palestinian so, Jew. So uh, Christians is something that we invented to try to capture those who are going to say his way of doing all this and his enlightenment about life itself means something to us. Uh, it, I don't find a word for a non-Christian to be necessary. Okay. Let me ask you this. Did, according to, you know, mainstream theology, and I'll leave it to you to, to define that, did Jesus know that he was going to be resurrected? Oh, great. The Gospels have different versions of that. So in a lot of Christian theology, uh, one of the earliest debates about Jesus was, is he fully human or is he fully God? Uh, and that may sound strange, right? But what we're saying is uh, there was a, a heresy called docetism early on that the early church uh, erased. And it was that Jesus was fully God and just put on the appearance of humanity. So he knew everything that was happening and he taught us how to live as if he were a human. We could mirror him in our own humanity, but he wasn't really a human. He was fully God. And the church rejected that and said, no, he was fully human. So then there became this other heresy that said, well, if he's fully human, then he couldn't know everything. He had to have wondered. And the church accepted that hesitantly, but still wanted to hold on to. But remember, he's fully God. Uh, and in the end, we came to Christ has two natures. He's fully human, fully God. Uh, but some people do interpret that fully God part of Jesus to mean he knew everything. And I don't. Um, there are certain prayers. I would I would have guessed that you don't. <laughs> right. Well, and I'll tell because, because well, for me, and, and tell me if you think this is true also, if if he did know that he was going to get resurrected, that takes away the power of him being killed and, and sacrificed for what he did and, and, and for the values that he lived by. Because if you know what's going to happen afterwards and there's not a quote unquote real punishment, um, it, it doesn't mean as much. Perfect. And, and the four gospels kind of tell the story of his resurrection. Some of them have him praying before he's arrested and sweating blood as he desperately begs God to take this cup from me. And then at the end of the prayer, he kind of says, but even as I ask this, don't grant me my will, grant me your will, God. Whatever your will is, I'm willing to go along with, but please don't let them kill me. And then other versions of it have him prayerfully, calmly saying, the Son of Man will be killed, but will rise again on the third day. And it has a, a different attitude to it. Um, the most desperate Gospels were the ones written closer to his death. And the more calm, reflective Gospels were the ones written further from his death. So you can, in all four uh, versions of the Jesus story, the four Gospels are all in Scripture for us. So they... They do give some credibility to the desperate human Jesus who doesn't want to die and to the confident Jesus that trusts that even if he does die, God will do something um, beyond death. And, and I'm okay with that, right? Because that preserves the fully human and the fully God aspect of this person. Um, but a lot of people kind of pick a favorite gospel. And they, they go for the more human. He didn't know. He didn't know anything. And others go for the, oh, he knew everything and he was totally fine with it. He didn't mind. He was doing it for us. Uh, I tend toward the, the one where he didn't know. Now, granted, uh, did MLK know he was going to get shot? He didn't know, but he knew. Right? He... People were threatening things, throwing Molotov cocktails through his front window, sending him constant threats. And he he felt and he feared violence was coming his way. 
but his but, but his cause was worth risking himself in order to go forward in that. And I wonder what, if Jesus was like that. Yeah, and I totally agree with you. And we should all kind of think and struggle in our own sense of theology and and morality of what are those causes for us. The one thing I would nitpick you on is that knowing that you might die is different than knowing that if you die, you'll be resurrected. Oh, nice. And, and for MLK, a Southern preacher, uh, the resurrection, I feel, was pretty clear for him. But he also wisely wanted to live every moment of life. He didn't want to die. He didn't want to be a martyr. We did that to him because of what he said. And and that's where a lot of Christians will also disagree about Easter. Um, did Jesus want to die or have to die? And that's a it's a kind of a quickie core theological question that you can ask a Christian to figure out where they are on the wider spectrum. Some Christians would say Jesus had to die. Like humanity is crushed, we're all doomed, we're all trapped in sin, we're obviously never going to be able to follow the law completely ourselves. We were given the Torah, we were taught everything, and we didn't follow it. And every time the prophets come and reteach us how to follow it, we still break it. Oh my goodness, we're broken human beings, we'll never be able to meet God's expectations. Therefore, God sings God's own self in Christ to uh, pay the debt, to make the sacrifice. Um, and those are called atonement theories. What does Jesus' death do for humanity? Uh, and some Christians will say, yeah, he had to die. That, that, that's the only way God could solve the problem of creating a sinful humanity that God loved and didn't want to condemn. So God condemned God's own self on behalf of humanity. Uh, other people, and I'm more on the second camp here, say, nah, Jesus didn't have to die. We killed him. Like He was here to be a Messiah and a teacher and a prophet and to show us how to live. And if we had <laughs> listened and learned and followed and trusted, and built the kind of community and kingdom he was imagining, he didn't have to die. We, it would have been like Nineveh, right? We would have all heard the the prophet come into our town and tell us what we needed to hear, and we drop into sackcloth and ashes and repent and change our ways, and the, the world is saved. We, we didn't do so. That. You know, so in other words, from a divine point of view, or that's no better put. Um, so ontologically speaking, if I could use a, a grad school philosophy word, <laughs> nice Easter doesn't need to exist. Well, or didn't need to exist. It didn't need to exist in this way. God's salvation of humanity did not require Jesus' death for me. That, yeah, you put that better than I did. God, God's yes. going to save humanity some way, right? And Jesus was a path to that. And then we killed him. <laughs> and God goes, you're not going to stop what I'm doing. Watch this and raise him. And in our best attempt to deny God again, even with the power of death, God's able to to thumb God's nose at us and say, you think death has more power than me? I, no, I'm still more powerful than that. Watch the, this. Third day, Jesus rises again and struts around town and shows everybody, nope, it's me. Go ahead. Touch the, touch the nail holes. Put your hand in my side where you stuck a dagger the other day. Yep, it's me. I'm hungry, by the way. Anybody got any bread? <laughs> You know, and and it's oh, don't mention bread right now. Come sorry, on. okay. Anybody got any soon. fish? <laughs> There's one where he cooks fish for breakfast with uh, the disciples on the beach, and all of that is to say that that full humanity, that new body on the other side of death, it still has all the pleasures and amazement of the God's creation of humanity, but it has this new beyond deathness to it. I mean, my very cursory viewpoint of Easter is that it's a jubilant, happy holiday. The way you describe it, I wouldn't necessarily say more somber, but certainly more serious and introspective. And 
I mean, is it still is is it both? Is are people celebrating Easter wrong? Is just my view as a non Christian wrong? Well, if if the resurrection is an attached to the death, right, then there is something off about it. Resurrected from what to what? That's the Easter question. And what was a lot of people, a lot of Christians even, think of resurrection as my promise that on my death, I will personally be resurrected to be myself again with the people that I love who were good enough to make it to the heaven that I want to go to. And that's a, that's a very small Easter. That, that Easter is so small it fits inside a tiny little plastic egg. <laughs> so it, that's not a big enough Easter. And a lot of people see that as enough reason for a party. Well, when I die, I'm going to be raised and I'm going to be with my family. And those meanie people over there who don't think right and don't, you know, whatever, they're not going to be there anymore. And I'm not going to have to worry about them. That's going to be great. And I'm going to be rich because the streets are lined with gold. Um, and they throw a party for that. That is not Easter. I mean, Easter is, you know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is already in the heavens. Whatever God's vision of community is, that's coming. And the fact that it's not here already, that's our fault as humanities. And it's going to kill us, every single one of us. And the, whether you're rich or poor or white or black, you think you're winning some race, ugh, right? Those who are first on this race end up last in the great heavenly race. Dad gummit. And it's all going to get flipped upside down. And the new community is going to be resurrected and populated from God's beloved creation. So it is definitely worthy of a party. It's, it's amazing and fun, but I sometimes see people partying for more, uh, personal, even selfish reasons. Uh, what's in it for me? Where's my gift? What, when do I get in? And the Easter party has very little to do with having the, your ticket punched to some, <laughs> some party. It has to do with there being this massive party already going on and somebody coming to get you from death and invite you to it, even though you didn't know about it or deserve it. And is that your central message? I mean, is that is that kind of, you know, so every Passover when, when Shabbat, because Passover is a week, there's always a Friday night where there's Passover. So this coming Friday for me, when you preach on Sunday morning, is that typically your main challenge to everyone or your main teaching? Yeah, but Easter is – what I will try to do – we were talking about this with some other Christian pastors earlier this week that uh, – is it hard to preach Easter and Christmas Eve, Christmas? Like those two seem like so central, but it's getting harder to preach those. Um and I'm like, I don't know. It's kind of like, uh, did you ever go to Yacht Rock Review? Have you ever seen that band? No. <laughs> so there are these guys and, uh, guys and gals now, and they dress up in like seventies and eighties bell bottoms, unbuttoned shirts, and they sing all the greatest pop rock hits from the seventies and eighties. And Jill and I go to their concerts and, uh, we know every word to every song they sing. It is so fun, right? And you'll see young people, old people there. They're just the greatest hits for the 70s and 80s, and they're a cover band for all of it. I said, for me, Christmas and Easter is like going to a greatest hits concert. When you show up, and if all they do is play the new song, you're like, eh, that was nice. But but if you play the greatest hits, everybody sings along. So, so the Easter message, the core of it is, yeah, he is risen. He is risen indeed, we'll say. Hallelujah. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And that risen from what? Right? Risen from death. At risen for what? Right? To deliver God's community. So it's, it has to be attached 
to the communal aspect in order for it to be the good news. If it's just personal, he's risen from death, woohoo, I'm getting through death too. That's not good enough. That's a very shallow, empty, half Easter message. But if it's he is risen from death, death has lost its sting, is one way Paul says it, and somehow this new community that is everlasting, eternal, where we live together in harmony and peace and there is no more sickness, there is no more pain, there is no more grief or hunger or oppression or poverty or homelessness. All of that is going to be erased and it's coming. And and people are going to find themselves sucked up into it. It's just going to appear for us. That's that's amazing. Then the a, a little third part that I often include in Easter messages is, so get busy working on it now let you know let's That's, let's accelerate it that community to arrive sooner that if i may say so that's that's a very jewish kind of comment or at least one that i i, I perceive it as but and i'm not trying to appropriate you know your theology and say it's jewish obviously i'm, I'm being a little bit funny um i'm learning from I, I you have, and from jesus my my two that, favorite rabbis <laughs> <laughs> nice nice but please don't put me in front of him. I, I, I can't, I don't, I, I don't, uh, he, yeah, I, I, I was not as humble nor as, uh, generous as he was. Hmm. But, um, oh, I just lost my, my question, Joel. See, you compare me to Jesus and now I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm speechless. I'm completely. Well, I didn't befuddled. compare you. I just said you're one of my favorites. You're one of my two fair. favorites. <laughs> totally fair point. Thank you. I need to be put in my place very, very often, and it's good. Well, I was going to ask you one hard question, but that's not what I wanted to lead with. But since that's escaping me. So I know just from talking to colleagues who obviously, you know, have – thought about these things and theology and God and the Messiah and those sorts of things. And what I'll call, quote unquote, the average Jew. Okay. People will ask all the time, does he, does she, do they really believe that this person who lived in the first century really, yes, he really died. He probably was crucified by the Pharisees, all of those things. But do you really believe that it was a historical, actual event that he was resurrected? And as part of your answer, um, does it matter if it actually happened? Oh, that's great. I, yeah. And I'm so glad you asked the second one because the the second one's more important than the first. Uh, right. As I've you know, ventured in and out, observed Christianity from afar – and then entered, right, with a, a couple toes, uh, and then dove in to become a Christian preacher pastor. I continue to encounter uh, self-professed Christians of all kinds of denominations or level of engagement or involvement in Christianity itself who vary all over the place about the first one. Um I would say there are Christians who aren't sure Jesus was a real person. I, I would say there are Christians who think he was a real person, but was the illegitimate son of Joseph and Mary, not the, you know, a child by Holy Spirit of God. There are Christians who feel pretty sure that Jesus died and somebody stole his body. <laughs> and, the disciples made up the story about him being resurrected. I think anywhere on the spectrum, from barely believing core essentials of the story to buying the whole thing hook, line, and sinker, there are self-professed Christians all across that, that wide spectrum. For me, I feel pretty sure that that this Jesus of Nazareth was a real person. I feel pretty sure that he did say and do some of the things that we have some stories about him saying and doing. And I am quite sure that if he said and did those things, people killed him for it. I continue to see people 
get killed for those kind of things or less. So agreed. Yes. Uh, if, if he existed and did and said those things, you bet a hundred percent we, the leaders, religious and political leaders killed him for that. Then the resurrection part, the Easter part. I am betting everything that that's true. And the majority authors of the New Testament are a guy named Paul, who was a, a Pharisee among Pharisees, and he wrote a bunch of books and letters about Jesus. And he basically said, you know, <laughs> we Christians, if if Jesus didn't, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, we Christians of all people are the most to be pitied. <laughs> but then says, but if he did, but if he was... And begins to imagine all the implications of that. And not just for Christians, but for God's whole world. That's where I get excited. And it, whether or not it is actually a hundred percent true the way I'm thinking of it, what's more important for me is I lean into the belief slash hope slash imagination, slash joy, slash promise of what comes if it is. And, Beautiful. And I, because what that imagines is better than what is today. And I want the brokenness and the sickness and the illness and the, and the destruction and the war and all that of today to be erased. And I want the new to come. The hard part about there's the one and two, the step three is, Am I willing to carry a cross in order to make it happen myself? And and that's where I feel like if, if somebody is going to be measured against Jesus, uh, boy, I don't think any of us can measure up to that. But one sign of that would be, are we taking up our own cross and following him to make that kingdom come? Uh, and and I don't see a lot of people doing that. So does it really matter? I hope not. So um, two comments. One is I remembered what I was going to say as you were just uh, sharing that. And that is uh, there's a book I have that's written. I believe it's written by a rabbi. It's certainly written from a Jewish point of view. And uh, the book's title is There Is No Messiah and You're It. I may have brought it up on an Afterlife episode or something. But that's what I was thinking of when you talked about, okay, now get to work. That it's not all about it, Jesus. It, it's it's about you, us, take uh, you as Christians, uh, taking that message and then doing something with it. Um, the other thing I was going to say um, – which is somewhat off topic, but uh, I was thinking about you hard yesterday, Joel, because I was getting a um, – my car had a recall and needed a software update. So I'm sitting at Honda for about 45 minutes and, you know, the indoor lobby of Honda is the last place I would expect two strangers to have a religious discussion. But there we had it and it was two people that, you know, it was the whole where do you go to church? I, I heard the whole conversation. And the woman at one point asked, so what does it mean to be saved? And I'm just sitting there. I was like, oh, I want Joel to be here so badly. And the, the gentleman said, well, you know, faith in Jesus. And she said, Ab absolutely. I don't understand why people, why people have a hard time with that. And then they started talking about the vaccine. And I'm, I, I, one of the things that made me think of this is the comment you said about it's not just saving my life. It's about us all. She was talking about how she's not against the vaccine per se, but she doesn't need to get it because if she dies, she's going to heaven and that'll be better anyway. And I'm just thinking there are so many theological problems with what you just said. <laughs> and not to mention, you know, the, the problems of, well, what about other people and your place in society? And it was just a gosh, I wish Joel was here moment because I think you would have gotten involved in the conversation as opposed to me who had one AirPod in his ears just <laughs> typing away on my iPad, my, you know, ostensibly minding my own business while I was absolutely engaged with this conversation. 
Oh man. Yeah. That, that one hurts. Um, there it is, right? That is the, that's the bad Easter. <laughs> so I don't know how to, how to help folk like that, um, or what to, what to say to them. Um, I, I'm never going to try to take that away from her. Uh, she's, I wonder if she attends worship with a community somewhere. I think she does, judging from the conversation. And I, you know, I don't want to psychoanalyze these two people. Of course not. Other than, you know, other than the kind of theology espoused, which I, I think fits into neither of ours. Um, sure. But I, I do. I mean, I, I find it, 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 you know, the, I'm sure you've seen this just as a human, let alone a Christian, the, you know, wh- wh- the footprints on the beach and, you know, Jesus carried me, the, uh, you know, this whole idea that all you need to do is believe in Jesus and then Jesus will be with you and will help you through your difficulties. And I mean, that to me sounds like the ticket punch. And, and there, by the way, there, there's parallels in Judaism for this. I'm going to do these mitzvot so that God rewards me. And if I don't these, do these mitzvot, who knows what will happen? I mean, there's a, I'm not by any means, um, judging one over the other. I'm just judging that kind of mentality. I, I think that's spot on. Uh, so in, in reformed theological Christianity, what we try to remember is if we're doing something in order to, get something in return from God. If we're putting, um, if we have this if-then conditionality to what we're doing with God, if I blank, God will blank, uh, then we're probably messed up. We're probably off. Something's wrong about that. We are trying to manipulate and control God. And that is a very arrogant, nasty position to put ourselves in. Um, really, it's the only one that, that works is to realize God's the creator. God is the, the life giver. God is the one who brought us into being out of nothing. And when we return to, to ashes and dust, God can rebreathe us into being again. Our only response to that kind of God is, what do you need? What, what do you, thank you. What do you need me to do? Uh, so we look at grace first and then respond so that our response is never to earn a grace. It's always okay. a thank you for the prevenient grace, the, the, the grace that came beforehand. Uh, and the reformed theological perspective tries to flip those around. So it, it, the footprints thing I can do, <laughs> the footprints in the sand, that's fine. When you are arrogantly walking by yourself, thinking you were fine, thinking you had the whole world all on your shoulders, uh, right? God was carrying you at those points because you screwed up, right? And when you said, Oh, God, I'm, I'm sorry. What, what do you need from me? I'm willing to work for you. God set you down and you walked on. Oh, that's nice. It's a good reframing. Well, also because they're at, I mean, certainly in Judaism too, that there absolutely is a time for comfort where, you know, we, if you don't need to be challenged, nor should one be challenged all the time. I mean, th- th- there's that balance of, of comfort and challenge. I, I think you talked about your word, um, incur, encouragement, which I've taken to heart. Well, the um, challenge is after the comfort. So the comfort has to be true, but the, problem I find as a preacher is I have to challenge the source of people's comfort. I, I It's not okay for me to let them be comfortable in a misaligned comfort. Like, well, God's going to save me, but he's not going to save him because he's mean. God's going to save me, right. but he's not going to save them because they're Muslim. God's going to save me, but he's not going to save them because they're a murderer or a liar or whatever. And I'm like, wait a minute. At God's own table, he had Judas and Peter and Doubting Thomas. It, it, there were sinners all around him at his at his Easter Passover table. <laughs> if I can squish those two words together let, for a second. And let, uh, before we conclude, what is the 
correct greeting. I mean, does one say happy Easter, meaningful Easter? Other than he is risen. That I'm not going to say, but I'm happy to say, you know, happy Easter or something of I that I don't think sort. there is one, but inside, you know, and you, we, we don't need one. Uh, I don't think healthy Christians impose our language on others. Right, we just use it inside ourselves. So, oh, for so sure. Whatever you, for if sure, you want to say Happy Easter, that works. I'm fine with that. If you want to say, "Hey, how you doing?" You know, Happy Sunday, whatever. I'm okay with any of the above. Inside the church is, "Hallelujah, Christ is risen," and it, they right. will say, "Hallelujah, He is risen indeed." Well, because I mean, you know, as you know, Jews te- as a minority tend to be very sensitive about words people say on our holidays, and as a, I'm, I'm not going to say a Christian nation, but as a non-Jewish nation, um, we do know a lot of people who celebrate Easter and we want to, you know, for those that have that faith, we want to sure. encourage that. And, you know, especially people we're close to. Every um, time I say hallelujah, I think about his Jewishness. Sure. Right? It's, sure. Well, it's Psalm 150. Right. And Ale is praise. And then the, the back end of that is the unspeakable name of God. So we are... We're basically saying praise God uh, in in one way or another. Absolutely. Well, I think we can end with that thought. Hallelujah. <laughs> the- and uh, and as I uh, <laughs> as I eat uh, Cadbury Easter eggs and Peeps, um, which I do all year round, um, I, I do hope um, for our listeners um, that celebrate Easter. It's a meaningful. And both challenging and comforting holiday um, that continues uh, to bring a sense of shalom, of completeness and peace to I us. Have a, I have a weird question for you. You said an egg is on the Passover plate, correct? Correct. I wonder if the Christian Easter egg is an appropriation. Oh, it's so interesting. I I have no idea. I've never even thought about that sp- specificity before. I thought about Passover, as you know, um, as an appropriation. Um, that is interesting. I, I don't know. If so, I also I'm don't know sorry. what we're going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't hold you responsible, I promise. Something else I don't know is what we're going to talk about next week. Because last week we knew we were going to talk about Easter. So uh, I look forward to texting with you in the in the near days. I'll give you until Sunday, of course, right. until after Sunday. But uh, we will be back next week, listeners. Nice. Thank you for joining us on the Real Religion Podcast today, where a rabbi and a reverend walk into a podcast and talk real about religion. I'm Reverend Joel Talbert. And on behalf of Rabbi Eric Linder and all the Real Religion fans out there, we thank you for being with us today and invite you to send us any feedback or suggestions or topic ideas to Podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, keep it real. <laughs>